some more. And today, we have a very special guest, a guy who I know very well from my childhood growing up in Australia. This is a guy who is a multiple MVP and finals MVP in the NBL Australia. He's also represented the Australian Boomers national team at the Olympics in Sydney and Beijing. I should also add that he once played in the NBA with Dallas Mavericks and the Chicago Bulls. Please make welcome Chris Anstey. Chris, how's it going, mate? Yeah, well done. It's going very well. It's, uh, it's great to speak to you guys. You're a long way from home. Yes. And Chris, I just want to let you know how important this is to me. He completely like overshot me being here. He always introduces me, then the guest, and today he just skipped me. So oh, that's how important you are. And now Nee and I are We've got a connection. He spent some time here in Melbourne and he's, and he's lives in Australia. So we're, we're looking out for each other right now. That's it. We're going to look out for each other no matter where we are. And as always, I am joined by Mr. Justin Williams. Justin, don't, don't, make up, I don't make up for it now. We're arguing. We are in a fight okay, now. So. Right. We're fighting. Don't you worry. We're going we're gonna to fight more as this conversation goes on. So you, you keep that energy. Now, Chris, before we go any further, take us to the... The situation, which is a lot more serious and is a bit unfortunate in Melbourne. You're currently in lockdown. Tell us how um, that has been for you and how you're getting through it. it it's been interesting and um, I, I'm probably a little bit more positive than others. And, you know, as you say, COVID has affected everyone around the globe. Um, we're in the middle of a six-week lockdown and we have an 8 p.m. curfew and, you know, we're not allowed more than five kilometres from home. So... I'm pretty fortunate to have a roommate that I actually like. Um, I've got three kids and, you know, we've got a house full, so we, we keep ourselves amused. But um, you know, I've said to a bunch of people here, I, I lived in Russia for three years and it wasn't Moscow or St. Petersburg, it was, it was Perm and Kazan, so at the base of the Ural Mountains, uh, bordering Siberia. So I've kind of done lockdown before. Um, I've done isolation. Um, this is pretty easy. We're, we've got technology, we've got social media. Um, you know, for athletes, we spend a lot of time in hotel rooms, so it's not too dissimilar. It's been a nice little period to, to reset, I suppose. And, um, you know, there are a lot of cliches out there, but uh, we're, we're figuring out what we miss and we're figuring out what's important. So it's tough for a lot of people, um, but at the same time, hopefully, they, um, you know, we, we come out of this in a better place. Mm. Hopefully. Exactly. Um, Chris, <clears throat> as you know, that Nee and I are performing or – interviewing you from Canada and you have a little bit of Canadian connection there when you played with, with Steve Nash. What was it like to play with Steve Nash and uh, Derek Nowitzki? It was incredible. And look, Steve would be probably the guy in the NBA that I respect most. And I, I say that, you know, when I'd been in Dallas for a year and Steve got traded from the Suns to come and play with us, you know, right at the end of or coming into the lockout year and, we spent, we lived in the same apartment building and we spent a very, very long off season training together. So I got to know him pretty well. I got to know Dirk pretty well. Um, keep in mind, Steve was a third string point guard at the Phoenix Suns when he arrived and he was brought in to be our starting point guard. So fair to say the first month, maybe two months of that shortened season, every time Steve brought the ball down the floor, our home fans would boo. He was really struggling to, to perform how the crowd expected him to. And, yeah, he, I've never seen someone work harder than Steve, but he just wasn't getting those results early on. And I, I tell a story about Steve that I, I turned up to a, a medical treatment late one night, at yeah, 9 o'clock at night, and there he was. And I think a lot of people in Canada that would now be familiar with the hour work at an hour on the clock, flies up and down the court shooting runners and jump shots and, I caught him doing that and sort of asked him at the end what he was doing. And he said, look, I'm not, I'm not fast enough. I'm not strong enough. I can't come to a two-foot jump stop in the lane. So I've got to teach myself to shoot the ball at, at, at full speed. And, you know, a few of us thought he was crazy. But, um, you know, over time, clearly the booze went away. Mm -hmm. um, he went from being somebody that the Dallas fans really didn't want in a Mavericks uniform to the MVP of the NBA and, in most people's minds, that's the best basketball player in the world. And it's a credit to him. He was the hardest working individual I've ever come across. And um, probably the biggest compliment I'd give Steve if, the, if it was a non-basketball environment, if we're at the pub having a beer and he didn't know the game and he walked in, he'd, t he'd talk to you like any other guy at the pub. So, uh, no, look, he's highly respected here. And, uh, 
you know, some fond memories of my, of my time with him. Fantastic. Now, Chris, you talked about uh, resilience going through lockdown and also spent in your time in Russia. Um, tell us about how you got through the 99 NBA lockout. Um, it, look, it wasn't too hard. It, it was, you know, we, we had to find our own gym to train in. And uh, as I said, I lived in the same apartment building as Dirk and Steve, so I had two ex- exceptional training buddies. Um, we also had a very small hole in the wall bar across the road from home, so that made it easy too. But um, no, look, it, it was something I never really understood. And I came from a professional league in Australia where I thought I was doing really well financially, making $60,000 a year. And, you know, I signed when I got drafted for about a million dollars a year and I was being told to argue the fact that that wasn't enough. And I, I just didn't understand. Um, I just wanted to play basketball. I, I wanted to be a part of the best basketball league in the world. And um, it was disappointing. Um, you know, when it finally got going, the, the, the season was tough. It, it was 50 games in 82 days. We weren't a very good basketball team. And, you know, we lost a lot more games than we won. So it was a pretty brutal season. Um, but the, the lockout itself, look... Uh, if there's a positive, I, I really got to know Dirk and Steve. I still tell stories about them to young basketball players here about the type of work ethic they had and the type of different drills that they would do and uh, certainly learnt a lot in my time. That is a powerhouse. Steve Nash, Chris Anstey and Dirk Nowitzki all under the same roof. They got two of them, <laughs> right, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing for that. Um, come on, Chris. <laughs> no, I was going to say they got two of them right, and then they got Dirk. That's right. Yes. Right. Yes. Oh, there we go. Can we get Dirk on? I, I want Dirk to hear that. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so, Chris, you joined uh, the Chicago Bulls in a post-Jordan era. What was it like working with Jerry Krause as GM? It's funny watching the last dance. The only thing I knew going into the 97 draft was that the Bulls were going to draft me with their draft pick. So the last pick of the first round. And Luke Longley was there. Clearly, they're in the middle of a dynasty. And that was really, really exciting. I I had no expectation outside of the fact that I might go and play for the Bulls, sit all the way down to the end of the bench and get the best seat in the house to something pretty incredible. And I, I suppose... You know, in retrospect, Don Nelson was the only genuine front office guy to come and visit all the way down in Australia and watch me play and and meet with me. And, you know, of course, he would become the head coach, but uh, most teams even back then would send maybe a scout or that that asked some other people here in Australia. But Don Nelson made the trip. Um, So I ended up at the Mavericks and, you know, still have very close ties to the Mavericks and I ended up at the Bulls. Um, you know, it was interesting playing with probably a lot of the guys that were a part of that second three-peat, but, yeah, the, the stories were there, the history was there, but it was clearly a team in a rebuild and, or a dismantle and it was reasonably dysfunctional. Tim Floyd was a brand-new coach and, you know, my learning from that was everybody was trying to prove themselves from Tim Floyd to Elton Brand to Ron Artest to the guys who'd been around the league a long time and wanted to prove they could uh, hold down a, a bigger role than what they had on a successful team. So it was, was, it was really dysfunctional, incredible human beings, great people, but it just didn't work. And that turned out to be my last year in the NBA. That's unfortunate. But you would go on to do great things back home in Australia. Just before I get touch on that, tell us about... Mr. Corey Benjamin, one of your teammates. At the Bulls. Tell <laughs> well, us about Corey him. Benjamin, he was, I, I know you probably had a leading question, but Corey Benjamin, I think everybody's seen the YouTube clip, haven't they, with, you know, he playing one-on-one against MJ. And we, we were down in Atlanta and he was, he was reasonably, yeah, in reasonable levels of self-confidence. And he was having a bit of a discussion with some of the guys that he was as good a one-on-one player as anyone and might even be able to beat Michael Jordan. And word got back to Michael Jordan. And, um, yeah, if you've seen the YouTube clip, you'll understand that it was a dismantling. Um, 
MJ talked a lot of trash. I sat on an exercise bike. Really unfortunate that the camera was above my head and you know, I can't actually prove to my kids that I was there. But um, no, one of the funniest lines I've heard on the sidelines was Bill Cartwright, who was assistant coach at the time. Corey came out and had 25 shots one game. Again, he was trying to prove that he belonged in the league as a second round draft pick on a, on a really average team. And he might have only gone eight of 25. He took off to dunk. And, you know, whoever the defender was stood underneath him and he almost tripped on him in midair. And Bill Cartwright's got the really raspy voice, but he's looked down the bench and he used probably a little bit more colourful language. But he said, this guy right here, he out jumps his ability to land. And that was Corey Benjamin. He was an incredible athlete, but he was still developing probably the craft of playing basketball when I knew him. Right. Oh my God. So I was going to say that seems pretty memorable, but like what's your most memorable moment in your playing career, whether it be in the NBA or no, the look, well, my roommate's actually sitting next to me and he's shaking his head because clearly he's beating Michael Jordan. Um, I played, yeah, the year, my, my rookie year at, you know, we got towards the end of the season. I was playing with Michael Finley, Cedric Sabalos, AC Green. We weren't very good. It's a bit of a common thread with the NBA teams I played with. We weren't that good. Um, but, you know, the Bulls came into town and, you know, I knew Luke Longley. And all I knew was I got to watch and, and perhaps play against Michael Jordan. And it was going to be incredible. Um, I'd been playing 32 minutes a game. Uh, leading up over the month leading in. So I knew I was going to play. And I didn't play a minute in the first half. And I had family and friends who'd flown from Australia to watch me play against Michael Jordan. And I was a little bit upset because, you know, back then, no social media. All we had was group emails. And I wanted my photo with Michael Jordan because people in Australia weren't going to believe that, that a kid who played tennis until he was 17 years old played in a basketball game against the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan. And I didn't play. So I'm thinking at halftime, I'm thinking, how do I get into a photo with Michael Jordan? Because I can't walk up to him in the game if it's garbage time and I get in, put my arm around him and sort of point at the camera bank and say, hey, Mike, would you mind a photo? So I thought, I'm going to foul him really hard if I get in. And surprisingly, I suppose, I, I got in early in the third quarter and – all kinds of emotions, excitement, nervousness. I was absolutely as scared as I've ever been on a basketball court. But um, I, I guess found my way into the game and my role was to, to leave Dennis Rodman and go and, you know, double team Jordan anytime he caught the ball on the elbow. And a um, couple of deflections, a couple of turnovers and Finley went crazy, Sabalos went crazy. We ended up tying the game and sending it into overtime and I suppose... The three and a half minutes of overtime I played when I got subbed back in because I'm seven foot tall, but they put Sean Bradley in for the tip in overtime, you know, seven foot six. And when I got subbed back in in overtime to replace Sean, um, that was probably the weirdest emotion because it felt like I was being subbed in to, to close out the Bulls, which was just stupid. Um, but I hit a jump shot. I had a dunk. I tell people I dunked on Scotty Pippen, but I dunked near Scotty Pippen um, and got into a little tussle with Dennis Rodman that, you know, got the two second clip on the last dance. And um, look, it's a bit of a, for me, it's a dumb and dumber analogy that, you know, Lloyd says to the, or the girl, you know, what's the chances of a, a girl like you ending up with a guy like me, you know, one in a hundred, one in a thousand, one in a million. And that was me, you know, what's the chances of a, a kid for, that plays tennis from Kiel or beating the Chicago Bulls? But if the one existed, then why not make it the first time? And look, Michael Jordan's not calling me for a rematch, so I'll probably go to my grave never losing to Michael Jordan, which is a pretty special record. And there's a list. There's a few of us, but most of them played against Jordan as a Washington wizard. So I'm very happy to be on that list. And look, it's 23 years later and I'm still telling, talking about it. So... Clearly, it was a special moment. I was going to say, until Michael Jordan listens to this podcast, calls you up, flies you know, up I, I, I hope he does. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. <laughs> I can see it now. So we'll have the first leg in Melbourne, and then we'll have the second leg in North Carolina, or wherever he is nowadays, Charlotte. I'm guessing he's 
up there. And then we'll come up to Toronto for the decider. Because yes. Yeah. Because good things <laughs> happen in Canada. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Nina will comment on the game. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best not to call any fouls on you, Chris. Perfect. <laughs> He'll forget now, to reintroduce me again. It'll be great. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Chris, what is your best advice to young players who want to be like you and what are coming up? I'd probably tell, well, I do tell, you never know who's watching. Um, a lot of opportunities present themselves at moments where you don't expect them to. And, um, there, there are so many young athletes out there that, are fantastic when they know they're being evaluated but switch off and tend to become more lazy and revert to habit when they don't know there are eyes on them. So, you know, it's always interesting to watch those young, talented athletes when they don't know they're being evaluated to find out who they really are. Um, so I, I suppose that lead turns around to be, you know, becoming the best version of yourself more consistently and more often. And look, it's hard work. It does take a lot of work. It does take a lot of time and, I think to be great at anything, you've got to really embrace being great at the boring stuff. You know, we all want the, the YouTube clips, we all want the highlights, but not too many young athletes out there are prepared to do the boring work that gives them the opportunity or provides a platform to be successful. Speaking of success, exactly. Speaking of success, though, the NBL has making like significant moves right now, especially with uh, Lamelo Ball and RJ Hampton. What do you feel is going to come of the NBL? Like, is it like, what do you predict for its future? You're right. It's going really well. And I spent a long time in it. I'd be, it'd be remiss of me being on a, on a talk show in, in Toronto, not to mention one of my favorite teammates. And I won two championships with Dave Thomas, mm. who went to Michigan State. I'm not sure if you're aware of Dave, but Canadian basketball player who I've got some very fond memories winning two championships with me is now uh, doing great things at Michigan State, his alma mater. Um, also coached a, a big seven-foot kid named Scott Morrison when I coached in the league. So we've, we've come a long way. Um, the ability to attract talent like Lamelo Ball today, uh, like RJ Hampton today, and really be a global threat to what the G League provides and to the pathway that NCAA College provides young athletes is incredible for this league. Um, I know the league is is very hopeful that Lamelo gets drafted in the top three, and I think he will. Mm. Um, there were more NBA eyes on our league this year than there have ever been. Um, and there's certainly an awareness that, you know, it's not a second-tier league anymore. And I think at times over the 30 years it's been in existence, it's probably set a couple of tiers below the Euro League, the, you know, the Italian League, the Greek League, the Russian League. Mm. But there's been an injection of money. Um, you know, Jerry Colangelo, Jerry, Brian Colangelo is the most recent owner who, who bought the team that Lamelo played for. Mm -hmm. um, so we're getting high quality imports. We're getting our best Australian players who had to travel overseas to earn genuine money coming home. Mm -hmm. um, and I genuinely think we're one of the best five leagues in the world. So it would not surprise me if we see more young kids come to Australia. Didi Lazada was another kid who was a draft pick and will probably be in the NBA next year. And um, some very good young talent, a, a young kid to keep an eye on, you know, maybe towards the end of the first round and that potentially early second. Uh, a young kid named Josh Giddy, who's a very similar type of player to Lamelo Ball. Not quite as polished, but I think he'll be an NBA player. Yes, I was just about to ask you about Josh Giddy, Chris, because he's as he's at the Adelaide Sixers, if I'm not um, mistaken, and I've heard good things about him. So tell our audience here in North America why we should be looking out for him, if you don't mind. He's he's got genuine. I coached him at the Under Twenty National Championships, and he's got great length. He passes the ball as well as anyone I've seen in the last two decades. Uh, his jump shot's evolving, and he's sneaky athletic, um, but he's a genuine, probably 6'5 point guard. Um, his dad was a legend of the league uh, and one of the great guys of the league, so Josh is very grounded. Um, but as I mentioned before, there, there will be a lot of comparison between Josh Giddy and Lamelo Ball. Pass first point guards, great length at that spot, hands in the passing lanes, um, 
you know, really good in that uh, in zone type defenses, and even in the NBA, we're seeing more and more zone defenses. So, I, I think, uh, you know, I think we'll see him in the league, and I think we'll see him drafted, you know, late first, early second round. Yes, and he's Australian, so that excites me a lot because he'll be playing for the Boomers, and I guess he might be at um, Tokyo twenty twenty one. Now, on that point. Can you see the Boomers breaking through for an elusive medal next year? You know what? I can. A lot will depend on whether or not the NBA season is running when they choose to host the Olympic Games because there's got to be the danger that the NBA season will conflict with the Olympic Games or, in fact, that NBA players will be so fatigued from this abbreviated restart to this season and into next season that they might not avail themselves to play. Um, you, if everyone is available and we can put our, our most talented team on the floor, yeah, Rio proved that we can compete with anyone. But the thing with being here in Australia is we become so isolated, we forget to keep up with the rest of the world. And Canada is genuinely the country that I think can surprise a lot of people. They're very well represented in the NBA. They haven't had a successful international history. Um, Steve's been their best player by a million miles, but, you know, they've got the depth, they've got NBA talent and experience, and I think they've taken as many steps forward as anyone in the world to compete with the European and the South American powerhouses as well, of course, as Team USA. I was going to say it's unfortunate for Team Canada because not a lot of players, even America too, not a lot of uh, internationals really want to play in FIBA just because, like you said, the fatigue and they don't want to risk injury going into the NBA because I think the NBA championships are ranked higher than FIBA, which is interesting to me. Well, well, of course, and that's their livelihood. I mean, we're asking players to put at risk multi-million dollar contracts to represent their country and, you know, one of the biggest things I think that Basketball Australia did was to ensure... Uh, NBA contracts to allow those NBA players to represent the country. So if the worst case scenario happened and they sustained a long-term injury, then their salary would be covered because let's be honest, honest, it's it's a lot of money to put on the line. It is. It is. Sure. I'm going to ask you a quick question about a guy named Brent Brown. How was he as a coach for you? Brent Brown was, you know what? He is the coach to coach in the NBL that I wish I had have played for. And I nearly got there. And my my team in Melbourne folded back in 2002. And I, I gave him a call. I was weighing up what I wanted to do the, the following year. And I called, he was a coach of the Sydney Kings. And I said, look, I'd love to explore the opportunity to play for you next year. And he said, look, I, I would love to have you play for me. There's a little bit going on. Um, I'll fill you in next week, but give me a week. And it was it was a weird conversation. And, of course, a, a few days later, he was announced as a, a coach of the San Antonio Spurs and got his NBA career going. But Brett is, is authentic. He cares for his players. I know he's in the hot seat right now with the way that that team at Philadelphia has been constructed. Um, ironically, from an ex-teammate of mine, Elton Brand. So there's, you know, he's in the middle of a reasonably dysfunctional NBA franchise at the moment. But Brett's an incredible human being. He's done a lot for the National Basketball League in Australia. He's done a lot for our national program as head coach of the Boomers. Um, I'm sure whatever happens with Brett this year and moving forward, he's always going to be in a job because of the quality of person that he is. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, uh, Chris, just on the Boomers, you, as I said from the jump, you got to represent your country twice at the Olympics, and that's a dream for many young Australians. But not only that, you got to do it at home in Sydney in 2000 and also in Beijing in 2008. Take us through that. Yeah, it was – the Sydney one in particular was – it was really interesting because at the time, you know, I'd just finished my season with the Chicago Bulls. They wanted – me to spend the off season with them and their weight in their, their strength and conditioning program. And, but they weren't able to guarantee me that if I did that, I'd have a contract the next year. And 
I got to a space where I didn't want to get to the end of an NBA preseason and, ha- and miss out on both an NBA contract and the home Olympic games. And, you know, when I waited up, the Sydney Olympics was a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, it was the most incredible experience walking into that Olympic stadium, hearing the home fans, Andrew Gaze, who Americans and Canadians might know best as the Seton Hall representative at Collegiate, but one of the best players in NBL history and you know international basketball history was was our flag bearer. So we were all up towards the front of the Australian team walking into that stadium, and it was incredible. Um, but at the same time, it's incredible how one of the, the the best moments of your professional sporting life can turn into one of the most disappointing within a couple of weeks because, you know, we battled our way into the semifinals. And, of course, when you're in the last four in an Olympic Games, only one team doesn't win a medal. And we got blown out twice and we didn't win that medal. Um, so that, you know, it was, it was a hard pill to swallow. Um, and the, the, I suppose the bitter taste that left in our mouths afterwards was, was a tough one. So very mixed emotions at Sydney. And, you know, Beijing was a little different. My, my role was different. It was smaller. I was coming towards the end of my career and actually had a really good individual tournament, but dropped a couple of games early and crossed over against the United States in the quarterfinal. Hung with them in the first half, but... Um, Kobe Bryant went crazy in the third quarter from the three-point line of all places, and um, they put a gap on us in the third quarter, and we ended up playing, you know, playing for those fifth to eighth positions, which wasn't where we wanted to be. Um, but that's what it was. But look, to represent your country in Olympic Games is special. To play at that level is special, and um, yeah, very memorable. I was going to say, like, you've played against some of the best players from MJ, Kobe Bryant, just. Oh, that's got to, you got to tell stories like that all the time. You got to just catch Yeah, well, it's, you're right. And one, one of the ones that, that I had a teammate named Mark Worthington, and we played the drill, we played Team USA at the Beijing Olympics, and a very young Patty Mills, a very young Joe Ingalls, yeah, extraordinarily talented players, but still really raw and young. And we were the older guys on the team. And even at the hotel, in the we, we played them at the hotel in the pre oh, sorry the, the pre Olympic game tournament, and you could just see that these guys were nervous being around LeBron James and Kobe and Dwayne Wade, and you know, and we had this meeting with our coach Brian Gorgian, and he said, "How's the feel in the group?" And I said, look, it's nervous. And he said, "Look, if this thing goes bad early in the game, I'm going to get you guys in to settle it down." And sure enough, we're down. I think it was 11-0 or 11-2 early, and Gorgian kind of looked down the bench and nodded. And so Wertho and I substituted into the game for, I think think it was Dave Anderson and Dave Barlow, and they were shooting free throws, and and Wertho walked up to LeBron James, who was standing along the side of the key to rebound the free throw, and he grabbed him by the jersey and swung him around and said, boys, I've got number six. (laughs) <laughs> almost made it like he didn't know who it was. So I followed his lead and I, and I swung Dwight Howard around and said, I got number 10. And the other eight guys on the court are looking at us like, 10 years said, we know you know who we are. And our boys were like, what are you doing? <laughs> and it lightened it. But I guess what we were doing was we needed to remember we were playing five guys wearing blue uniforms we weren't playing their reputations. And that's a hard thing I think about playing legends of the game is oftentimes you're beaten before you start because you're competing against their reputation. And like I said, we competed well. Um, it, was, and it was interesting later on in the game, um, Mark Worthington was still talking a little bit of trash to try to keep it chippy. And um, LeBron James has looked him dead in the eye. And clearly LeBron knew his name. So he's gone, hey, where though? And that was enough for Wertho that he knew his name. He said, if you're going to talk trash, don't wear my shoes. And you look down and he's wearing LeBron's shoes. So it was fantastic. But um, those are the sort of memories, I think, outside of the, the medal games and winning champions. You just remember them because they're out of the box. You don't share them that often, but they were fantastic. It is. And just on the point of those memories and stories, your Facebook page has quite a following. With thousands of people following and reading your stories, what inspired you to start this? 
I got to a stage where, well, early days, I think a lot of athletes, maybe a lot, but I didn't think my story was that interesting. I didn't think my journey was that interesting. It was just me doing what I did. And you, you, I sat back at the end of my career and I got into coaching. And when, when I was coaching my players, I found that the messaging from some incredible coaches and players that I'd experienced along the way would always form part of my own philosophy. And I think hindsight affords you the luxury of understanding how fortunate you've been in your journey. And I had, I was around some incredible people. You know, we've mentioned a few that I played with. I've had incredible coaches. I've, I've had incredible teammates and they taught me so much on a basketball court, but probably more importantly off it. And I wanted to share some of those stories. I, I don't profess for what I know to be right. Um, but I think they're interesting stories and I think some people can relate. And I guess I just wanted to share the stories about the other people, not about me, but what I'd learned from some pretty incredible people. As you say, I've written about Steve Nash. I've written about Dirk Nowitzki. Um, I've written about Sean Kemp and a bunch of other people here in Australia that really impacted my life and taught me things that I still carry with me today. Amazing. I honestly didn't know that you played tennis with Mark Philippoussis until I, I saw your page. That's I did, no. Oh, Mark you are a man of many talents. Yeah, we're a year apart. And um, one of the most surreal experiences for me as a tennis player and for our group of junior players was, I, I can't recall what year it was I should, but he played in the night session against Pete Sampras at the Australian Open and beat the number one player in the world in front of, it felt like every single set of tennis eyes in the world. And maybe a little bit like my experience with beating Michael Jordan, here was Mark Philippoussis, the young kid that we grew up playing tennis with, just beat Pete Sampras in a one-on-one -on -one contest. It was incredible. And then he went and lost, I think, to Todd Woodbridge or Mark Woodford the next round. But um, the moment was incredible. Fantastic. Amazing. Well, speaking of games, um, we've got one for you. Justin's got one prepared. You ready to play? Okay. Uh, okay, so this game is called Start Bench Trade. So I'm going to give you three okay. options, and you have to start a player, bench a player, and trade a player. Okay. okay. And feel free to expand on your options or your answers. Oh. Number one LeBron James, Steph Curry, Kevin Durant. Tough one straight up. I would, I would start LeBron James because he's the most physically dominant athlete that the NBA has seen in a lot of years. Yeah. I don't think he's the greatest. I think Michael Jordan is the greatest, but LeBron James is the most physically dominant athlete that the NBA has seen in a long time. Mm -hmm. I would trade Kevin Durant. Oh. Because uh, look, I. I think there's been enough spoken said about Kevin Durant. But the thing about Steph Curry, imagine having a, having a shooter like that come off the bench. Yeah. Um, but Steph Curry revolutionised the game, expanded what was considered a normal scoring area, and I, I think Steph Curry is really, really relatable because if he walks down the street, he's more like you and me, or not you and me, but you two guys, because he's not that dominant physical specimen. He looks, inverted commas, normal. Um, he's like Steve Nash. Um, but he needed, his skill set he needed to develop to become successful. Look, Steph Curry, for me, is one of the most intriguing players in the NBA, and I can't wait to watch him again next year. So I'm actually very excited, even for Kevin Durant to come back too, because he's, uh, he, he's, like, he's been injured with his ACL, right? When obviously the Raptors one and he was injured but uh it's all good i mean victory is a victory nonetheless all right question number two in the prime of their career michael jordan larry bird steve nash oh you're killing me because i've got to say <laughs> michael jordan. every single part of my heart wants to put steve nash higher than i'm about to because i love him to death and he's the best teammate i've ever had um, but you've got to take, I think Steve would be embarrassed if I put him above MJ or Larry Bird. Right. So it's Michael Jordan first, Larry Bird was a bench to, to bench Larry. Yeah. Which sounds Larry. ridiculous even saying that. And <laughs> look, at, 
Look, I'm going to have to trade Steve, and I'm going to trade him to the Raptors, so I feel like that's yes. a win-win. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I was going to say, speaking of the Raptors, you set up question three perfectly. Uh, Pascal Siakam, Fred Van Fleet, or Norman Powell? Well, I would have to start Pascal Siakam. Yeah. I, I, would, I would bench or keep Norman Powell. And I think the thing, if I put my coaching hat on, that, that Fred Van Vliet has going against him. I love him. I think he's been incredible and he's going to get paid next year. Oh my God, yes. But there are more of him. There are a lot more Fred Van Vliet's than there are Pascal Siakam's in my opinion. So, geez, especially speaking to you guys in Toronto, I hope, I hope they keep all three because okay. this is proving that the sum of the parts of a, of a championship team is greater than just one piece. And I've loved watching t- Toronto prove that it wasn't just about Kawhi. Mm. Uh, I would have loved, I know that I'm not sure what the awards are going to do. Imagine Pascal Siakam winning most improved player in the league twice in a row. I would have loved to have seen that happen. Mm. Um, but, but for me, there are just a few more friend band leaks. If I missed that, I'd be able to get another one. So unfortunately for me, he would be the one I would trade. Right. It's it's funny in Mississauga we have the G League as well like uh, the Raptors on a five play in my backyard essentially so I got to see Van Fleet and Pascal Siakam play when they were just newbies in the league and to watch them go from like where they are now so like those two really hold a special place in my heart and I, and I think that's one of the strengths of the Raptors program is that there's a really direct lineage to their G League team it may be stronger than any other team in the NBA which exactly. I think just further enhances their success well even um. Uh, what was it called again? Like some players who weren't playing very well, like Stanley Johnson, like this season, uh, and Matt Thomas too, after recovering from injury. Even Norman Powell, like keep, keep my Norman Powell had his shoulder dislocated like less than eight months ago, and he's back being dominant as sin. But um, they all have to play in the G League to recoup a little bit. Like that's by their coach's standards. They're just like you, you want to play in the big leagues, survive the mini league first, and then come back to us, kind of deal. Which you I know what? There's a statistic that I spend a lot of time with. It's it's games of shared experience. And if you can gain shared experience with teammates at any level, it helps the success or contributes to the success of your team at any level. Yes. So the, the fact that these guys are gaining shared experience in the G League, bringing that shared experience into the NBA, again, I think just helps the Raptors become successful. And I've got nothing but admiration for what they're doing. I think it was, I can't remember, it was, I want to say Will Chamberlain said it, but you can't teach chemistry. Some of them. That, that's exactly, it takes time. Yeah. Question number four. This one is going to, going to be home for you as well. I okay. Uh, if you had to start bench or trade, <clears throat> Mel Gibson, Hugh Jackman, or <laughs> Liam Hemsworth. <laughs> so who was the second one? Uh, Hugh Jackman. And then end off on Liam Hemsworth. I would start Hugh Jackman. And I'll tell you why. Because I was having pizzas what? for my daughter's birthday just around the corner from home. And we looked out the window. This is in Albert Park. Me, you'll, you'll know where Albert Park yeah. is in Melbourne. South, South Melbourne, that's where they hold the Grand Prix, Justin. Oh, that's yeah, exactly. exactly right. <laughs> yeah, and I looked out the window, and my son is a massive Marvel fan. And I thought, geez, that looks like Hugh Jackman. And he was walking into the local grocery store, supermarket. And um, I looked again at that Hugh Jackman. And I quickly got on Google, and sure enough, I, it says that he has a home, you know, the park, or Middle Park. And so I said to my son and daughter, just go and wander over the cross. Hugh Jackman just walked in. I said, but whatever you do, don't go into the supermarket and ask. Just wait until he comes out. Don't bother him. And as he came out, Hugh Jackman took the time to take my, at the time, 14-year-old son's phone. When he said, excuse me, Mr. Jackman, would you mind? took my son's phone, took a selfie with my son, my daughter and his mates and both of their mates. And it's, it's not, if anyone ever looks at my Instagram feed, it's been on that. So Hugh Jackman for doing that for my kids will always be my starter. Um, I had a little bit of a, a, a jump on Mel Gibson complained a little bit about the seats uh, when the Australian Boomers played Team USA and not quite having the view he wanted. So I'll trade Mel Gibson uh, and I'll bash Liam Hemsworth. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> that was amazing. 
All right, last one, last one. I love your stories that come with it. It makes it so much better. Uh, Jim Jeffries, Adam Hills, or Nazim Hussan? Not that familiar with Nazim Hussan. So, Nazim Hussan, so I'll, I'll bench him straight away. Sorry, I'll trade him straight away. I'm going to start Jim Jeffries. Again, for me, it's almost like a bit of a life hack. I think any time someone holds a special place in one of your children's hearts, you'll do anything for them and you'll always put them first. And Jim Jeffries holds a special place in my son's heart, so he gets to start on my team anytime. Awesome. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, it was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I, lo- I love that. It's probably our best game. Yep, that's our best game we've had so far. So thank you, Chris. Um, no, I'm, I'm, just I'm not sure the other games have been with... like. That's fun. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it was good fun. Where can our audience find you on social media? Uh, Chris Anstey 13. So C H R I S A N S T E Y, the number 13. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, and I'm on Twitter. So uh, jump on, have a chat. I, I, I actually love getting in conversations um, with basketball fans, with sports fans, with, with anyone really. It's uh, especially during lockdown, we've got a lot of spare time. So jump on, have a chat, come and say hello. Come and say good day. That's it. Hey, that'll be fun. Good. Make sure you two boys jump on as well. well. We'll have a chat on social. Oh, for sure. I'm going to send you photos of me and Jim Jeffries and everything that happened. I love it. Us. And we're going to tag Jim, and I'm going to try to. Get, I'm going to see how this. We can do this social media experiment. I'm going to see if I can't get Jim Jeffries. Let's test your relationship with Jim. Oh my god. So let, let's see if we can't find get Jim to send a shout out or a photo or. A, just anything to my yes. son and make his year be incredible. Well, for Toronto Talk Source some more, this has been your guy NWB with Justin Williams, and we've had a pleasure with the great Chris Anstey. For the love of the six, let's connect. Thank you for watching. Please click the like button and leave us a comment with your feedback. And don't forget to subscribe with notifications to see more engaging and interactive content. Toronto Talk Sports and more for the love of the six. Let's connect.